Come on, we're getting started today. I want to invite you, come on, join us at the altar. Come on, find your place here in the sanctuary for worship. Come on, let's put our hands together. Hey, it's a great day to be in the house of God. declaration this morning. Come on. I am a holy nation. Sing it with us. I am a holy nation. I am a priestly king, a chosen generation to bring my offering. I'm calling out for mercy. I'm crying out for grace. Oh God, come heal the nations and come change it.
He said, for too long, the praise in the Northwest has been too safe. It's been too safe, but not anymore. The Lord is looking for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And he's looking for a dangerous praise. He's looking for, can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear me? Y'all can hear? There's something that's gonna break open this morning. We have an opportunity. I mean, I'm telling you, the spirit of God has been moving all morning already. You just walked into it just in, an, in, in just a, uh, uh, an incredible environment. But it takes your participation and your, uh, your volition this morning to step into what God's doing. So we're going to declare it again, that the Lord, he rides in on the song and the sound of his people. You know what the scripture says? Y'all can hear me in the way in the back. The scripture says that the Lord inhabits he actually sits on the praises of his people. That's foolishness, but it works. I'm telling you, it's the real thing. The scripture is true. Y'all, y'all, y'all look up at me just for a second. Y'all look up at me just for a second. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. So that's why we sing, as we build a throne. As we build a throne in worship, guess what? Because what? A fire goes before him and it destroys him. See, when you flip on a light switch, there isn't a power struggle with darkness and light. I don't think you heard me. I said, when you flip on a light switch, there's not a power struggle between dark and light. As we build a throne in worship, all darkness
is you There's something in me it has to I won't let the storms cry I won't let the storms cry out yes.
working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you are come on even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop even when even when i don't see it you are to worship we prophesy we're declaring that what God did by his spirit he is still doing God is still healing he's still saving he's still setting free he's still resourcing you from glory 
He's still setting you up for success. He's still declaring over your life, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. He's still making a table for you in front of your enemies. Come on, th this is the God that we still serve. And he's still showing up in power and glory. And can I tell you, friend, when the church gathers in expectation, God responds with impartation. And that Jesus is here this morning. In a real sense, that God is here this morning. As we invite him and as we honor him, his power begins to work in and through our lives. And just through worship all the time, bodies are healed, minds are renewed, people are transformed, not just in this room, but folks live streaming from around the nation. Come on, how many of you are thankful that the power and the glory of God, it knows no boundaries, it knows no restrictions, it operates outside of time and space? Come on, God is so powerful that he can go into your past and repair a hurt. He can walk into your future and prepare a table. He can interject in your present and restore and renew your life. That's the God that we serve. So we prophesy and worship. We declare things that aren't as if they are. We use our faith. Listen, you don't have to be a hero of the faith this morning to get your breakthrough. You just need a mustard seed. You don't have to feel like you figured it all out. You just gotta be honest enough to admit that what you've got is not a lot, but it can still remove a mountain in your life. And so we use our faith this morning to declare. We use our faith this morning to prophesy. Even when I don't see it in the natural, God is working in the spiritual. He hasn't taken a day off. He does not sleep, nor does he slumber. All of his promises are yes and amen. Not one of his words falls flat. The plan and the path of the God is true. It is righteous. He guides us in the way that we should go, that we would never depart from it. This is the God that we serve. And I want to encourage you today. If you're believing for a miracle, don't hold your worship back until you receive it. Worship while you're waiting because God is worthy. Well, I haven't seen it yet. I still got some unanswered questions. I still got some problems that haven't been figured out. Still got some things that haven't yet come back together. But here's what I love about God. When God walks into your life, scripture says this, he restores the years that the enemy has taken. Come on, that's a word for some of you. That's a word for some of you gathered here this morning. You feel like, man, that divorce, that bankruptcy, that abuse, those things that I walked through, it just ate away the years of my life. And come on, can I declare over you today that the next 10 years of your life, God is gonna do more than the last 30 or 40 years of your life. He's gonna restore everything the canker worm has eaten. He's gonna redeem the time. He's gonna renew the time. Come on, God leaves no table left unturned in the restoration of your life. Come on, we're gonna sing this one more time. Come on, we're gonna declare it here in the Northwest that we are people gathered under the canopy of a God who is so good, so faithful, so worthy, so awesome, and we're gonna lift a sound in this place. We're gonna lift a sound that rattles off disappointment, a sound that shakes off hurt, a sound that breaks through sickness, a sound that helps restore and renew minds. And if the church doesn't cry out, then let the rocks cry out. Let's raise a sound in this place. Come on, one more time. Even when I don't, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working.
Hey, would you say hi to a neighbor on the way back to your seat, man? Thanks so much for joining us for church. Pursuit family, thanks for joining us for church this morning. We're so glad to have you here with us. The Pursuit exists to glorify Jesus and in doing so to bring people into an encounter with the presence of God. Here's what's coming up here at Pursuit. Starting December 5th, we're going to four services here at Pursuit. Our new service times will be 8.30, 9.45, 11, and 12.15. We're so excited to be able to make more room for all of the new people making Pursuit Church their home. We will see you all on December 5th at our new service times. Pursuit Nights is every first and third Monday of the month and you're invited. Our next Pursuit Night is Monday, December 6th at 6 p.m. Come enjoy fellowship, dinner, and development with the Pursuit community. Child care is provided, so make sure to bring the whole family. Hey Pursuit ladies, mark your calendars for December 10th from 6 to 8. We are having our Ethos Women Christmas Party. This is going to be an amazing time for the women in our community to come together, celebrate Christmas. There's going to be child care provided as well as desserts. This is going to be a great time to fellowship together. We'll see you there December 10th. That's all the announcements that we have for you today. Thank you again for joining us here at Pursuit. You can find more events happening here at Pursuit on our website, or you can find more resources like sermons or ways to become a member by going to thepursuitnw.com. And make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media by searching at The Pursuit NW. Hey Pursuit family, we want to say thank you again for joining us. Thank you for all of your financial support and prayers. This community is continually blessed by the faithful giving of God's people and we could not do church without your generosity. Today we want to extend an opportunity for you to partner with us through giving. There are a couple of ways you can give today on the screen here. You can text to give, give online through our website, or use the envelope in your seat back to come forward and put your offering in the bucket. In a few moments the band will begin to play and this will signify your opportunity to get up out of your seat and come forward to give. Thanks again for faithfully sowing into our church and we'll see you again next week. Hey Pursuit, we want to say thank you again for joining us here at our online campus. If you have any questions or want to learn more about getting involved, let us know below and a team member will follow up with you. You can also leave a comment and tell us from where you're tuning in. We love hearing where everyone is. There are lots of ways to get involved here at The Pursuit, but one of the ways you can help us is by giving us a follow on all of our social media accounts and help spread the word about what God's doing here at The Pursuit by sharing this live stream and by sharing and liking all of our posts on social media. Thank you again for being a part of the amazing things that God is doing here in the Northwest, and we will see you soon. A reminder again, we're launching new service types. Uh, December uh, 5th. And so we want to encourage you to take note of that. Invite a friend. Uh, God has continued to do something significant here uh, in this community. Oftentimes it feels like we're just hanging on for the ride. I think God moves oftentimes in spite of us, not because of us, but we're just thankful to be in the room when he shows up. And so we're going to invite you to be in the room when he shows up as well, four times here on Sunday morning. And so invite a friend, take note of these times. One of the ways that we're saving a little bit of time on our services is we're actually starting on time. 
for the last seven years, we've held church here, and we, we don't usually start on time. Usually when we start the five-minute countdown, is five minutes after, and we're just given uh, an opportunity for people to find their way into church. But we're going to start on time, and we're going to worship, and we're going to preach and pray, and we're going to see the glory of God fall here in this building. So I just want to encourage you, be on time, be a bringer. Let's build the house uh, of God together. I know that it's inconvenient to change times and have to sit next to people that you don't even know at church, but these are all signs of a healthy and growing church. That's why I never get really too irritated if a baby cries during service because if you don't hear any babies any of the time, it's because you're in a dead church, not in a growing church. And so we just gonna be okay. We just gonna be okay with a little life. We're gonna be okay with God filling the house. You know, sometimes we pray these prayers, God answer the prayers, and then we're upset that God answered the prayer. It's like God send revival, but don't take me out of my comfort zone. No, that's not how it works. God, show up in glory, but don't inconvenience me. It's not how it works. God, bring in the lost, but I just don't want to sit next to them. That's not how it works. <laughs> so God is filling the house. He's bringing folks all across uh, this community, and, and we're seeing God do incredible things. Just this week, just this week, I, I heard a testimony of, of uh, a husband and wife who, uh, he had been an atheist long term. She had been a Catholic. So I don't know, somehow they got invited to pursuit, came in here, experienced the presence of God, have both made decisions to follow Jesus. God is doing some incredible things here in this community. The Bible says God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He says he uses the foolishness of preaching. He says he uses the foolishness of the church gathering on Sunday morning. It don't make sense to the world around us. But scripture says the cross, in fact, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It doesn't always make sense. But here's what I found. When people encounter trauma, when people reach the end of themselves, when people need a miracle and they don't know where to turn, they're not looking for something that makes sense. They're looking for something that passes their understanding. They're looking for something that is deeper than their ability to intellectualize it. They're looking for a God who shows up in mysterious ways that you can't always understand or confound, but he shows up in the middle of your dark night to provide light. Now, I'm not trying to make God make sense. And in doing so, remove the beauty of what scripture provides. No, we don't need a God who fits within the confines of our understanding. We need to fit within the confines of his. And so that's why even on the island of Patmos, when God speaks to, when God speaks to the apostle John, he doesn't say, I'll come down lower. He says, you come up higher. And that's the word for the church is we're coming up higher into places that we don't always understand. But when the presence of God shows up, you don't always have words. You can't always define it. You can't always describe it, but you know he's here. You know he's here. You know, we do these Q&As on my social media about once a month. And I had some people asking questions this week, and, and they said, Pastor, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. I've never been in a church like this, but every time I come to Pursuit, as soon as the first song, the worship starts playing, I cry from the start of service to the end of service. And then I, they said, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not normally a person who likes to cry, but I just keep coming back. What is that? I said, that's the presence of God. <laughs> can't explain it. No, you can't, you can't put a formula on it. But when he's in the room, you don't have to hype it because everybody knows it. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm just hyper just by nature. That's because before you ever woke up this morning, I had three Americanos, a 12-pack of Red Bull. I'm ready to go. <laughs> but that's just who I am. But I'm not trying to hype it to convince you that God is here. If you got a brain in your body this morning, you know the presence of the Almighty is in the room. And when he shows up, Oh, it don't even matter what song you sing. When he shows up, it don't even matter what text we'll exegete this morning. When he shows up in the room, it's worth it to be there with him. Because one moment in the presence, it'll change everything about you. It'll change everything about you. Listen, it's not about an informed mind. It's about an inflamed heart. Because <clears throat> your heart will take you places your brain can't fit. And when the fire of God sits upon the throne of your heart, man, things begin to shift in your life. <laughs> And so this isn't about making it all make sense. I think sometimes we're worried, especially in charismatic community, to talk about some of the things the Holy Spirit does. And what if people don't understand? And what if it doesn't make sense? And what if it's offensive? And, and what if they think it's weird? No, it is weird. It is weird. Yeah, absolutely. It's weird that we still gather 2,000 years later and worship a guy that we believe got out of the grave. That's weird. It's weird that we believe in the fullness of time he was born of a virgin. That's weird. We, it's weird that he fulfills 4,000 years of Old Testament prophecy. Yeah, it's weird. But I'm so past weird. 
I'm so past trying to make it make sense. Paul says the carnal mind can't understand spiritual things. It says the natural mind can't understand spiritual things. But when a person has an encounter with a spiritual God, all of a sudden it opens the eyes of their understanding to see what God has always been saying to be true. God will make it make sense just get in his presence. He'll make it all come together, friend, just get into his presence. Now, I appreciate online, and we stream online, and folks watch all, all over the world from online. But there's something that happens when God's people gather in community. The God who is everywhere decides to be somewhere. All of a sudden, we hold up a magnifying glass to the presence of God, and it fills this place. Oh, there's nothing like being in church. Oh, there's a lot of human institutions. I tell you what, church is a great excuse to miss a lot of other things, not the other way around. Because here's the reality, the more you miss church, the less you miss church. But when God's people get in the presence of God, they're changed. They're transformed. I become a new man when I'm in the presence of God. All of a sudden, that anointing comes in the room and you go, oh yeah, I give my life for this. Yeah, sign me up for this. All of a sudden, God's presence comes in the room and it makes it make sense. Why? Because God's here. He walks with us, the one who is Emmanuel, the one who is with us day in and day out, every step of our journey. There may have been times where you felt distant from God, but there's never been a day where he's been distant from you. Now, he's the one who sticks closer than a brother. He's the one who is intricately involved in every facet of your life. We so undersell the omniscience and sovereignty of who he is. There's not one care that you have that he doesn't hold in his hand. There's not one concern on your heart that's not also on his. There's not one trial that you're ever walking through that he is distant from. No, he is the God who is with us. And I think especially going into this Advent season, maybe the thing that we ought to be most cognizant of as it pertains to the incarnation is that God is still with us. And I'll tell you what, a church that stands with God is always in the majority. One person with God, one man, one woman, one child with God is always in the majority. Oh, the church has survived 2,000 years of craziness. It survived persecution, tribulations, wars, famines, pestilence. It survived governments that support it, governments that oppose it. It survived in underground places and closed nations. It, 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 it's, it survived in cathedrals celebrated by Constantinople. I mean, it, it has survived. But going into this season, the Lord spoke to me. He said, not only will my church in the West survive, but it will thrive in the midst of chaos. Because the church is still the pillar of truth. Because Christ is still the foundation. He's still the cornerstone. But watch, he was the cornerstone that the builders rejected, but has become the chief foundation of our faith. If everything we do is readily accepted, that's not a good sign. It's a bad sign. No, when you follow Christ, there's going to be some things that you stand for that are rejected by the builders of society. But I'm not living for an earthly city. I'm living for a heavenly city whose maker is God, whose light is Christ, who is worshipped by legions of angels, who is surrounded by angels and elders who day and night cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Why? Because the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our God and of our King and to the increase of his government and peace there is no end. And guess what? The government is still on his shoulders. That's why even when your favorite politician loses, take heart. You know why? Because unless the Lord watches the city, the watchmen watch in vain. And guess what? Regardless of the election, the Lord watches the city. And guess what? Unless the Lord builds the church, the laborers build in vain. And God is building this church, and God is watching this region. And what looks like chaos to the world around us is strategy from God to the church here. While the world is playing checkers, God is playing chess. And he's strategically and sovereignly moving. And the Bible says he sets up and he tears down. It says he wounds and he binds. This is the God that we have. The one who is operating in divine strategy in this season. Uh, that's not even my message. I don't know what I'm preaching this morning. But anyways, I wrote a book. Um, it's called Baptism of the Holy Spirit. One of the greatest joys of my life has been able to walk people through an experience with Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit uh, is a member of the Trinity. Sometimes we forget that. 
And uh, it is a person. It's not a mystical force. It's not a frequency. It's not a vibe. Listen, if I'm in the hospital, don't send me thoughts and vibes. We're just going to send thoughts and vibes. No, keep your thoughts and vibes. (laughs) Keep your new age paganism. Keep it. No, if I get sick, give me some prayer warriors who go send a word of healing to raise me up. We need people who've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. What do I need the Holy Ghost to get to heaven? You need the Holy Ghost to get to Walmart. That's what you need. So I wrote a book, and we're giving it away for free after service today. And so we've got a limited amount of copies. If you want one and you'll commit to reading it, I'm more than happy to give you a copy today. They'll be at the back information booth after service. God bless. Uh, wow. Okay. Listen, <clears throat> I've been... I've been Criticized over the last number of weeks, of course, not by anybody here, but a lot of folks online who love to who get their identity out of being a critic, you know? It's like, it's, like, it's like people who operate as film critics, but nobody's paying for their opinion. Some people think it's their job to critique the bride all the time. They're like, well, I'm just a professional critic of every, no, I'm just a professional critic of everybody else's servant. <laughs> so I've been criticized this week, people upset. They say, well, the pastor's reading from his notes, like I'm cheating somehow on the test. <laughs> He's reading from his notes. I just, like being mad at a musician for looking at their sheet music. You know, I said, what? Well, he's reading from his notes. I don't really know if it's inspired. He's, you know, he's kind of cheating. He's got the cheat codes there. And it's like, here's the reason. Let me share with you why over the last number of weeks I've been a little more note heavy and a little less shoot from the hip heavy. Here's the reason why. Because in this season, I'm not using a chainsaw. I'm using a scalpel. Because the issues that we're talking about require strategy and precision. And it's easy for me to wing it. <clears throat> but what I'd rather do is study to show myself approved. I'd rather have eight pages of notes, even if I only get through two paragraphs, because I want you to know this message isn't just coming from me, it's coming through me. And so sometimes I write things down, yeah, and then I want to read the things that I've written down, because, you know, when you, when you, if, if for whatever reason you have to ever end up in the hospital because you've got a growth inside you, you don't want the ER doctor coming out with a, with a machete or a chainsaw, but instead a scalpel. Because in order to bring healing, instead of destroying the body, you need to make precise cuts. And I think sometimes people in public communication, they just all get rattled up about stuff. So they come out with their chainsaw on Sunday morning. And instead of helping people, they're hurting people. And instead of making cuts so that we can grow, they're ending people's lives. And they're depressing people's journeys. Now, I'm going to say some things this morning. And you just ought to make a commitment on this side of the sermon that you ain't going to get offended. <clears throat> But my heart is not to offend. My heart is not chainsaw, it's scalpel. So that together as a community, we can grow up into the things of God. Is not still Christ the great gardener? And does not scripture say that not only does he prune things that aren't growing, he prunes things that are growing, that they would grow even more? Well, I thought if I was fruitful, I don't need pruning. No, if you're fruitful, you need even more pruning. A growing church needs more pruning than a dead church. A growing believer needs more pruning than an unbeliever or a dead believer. Why? Because he's the great vine dresser. He's the great gardener of our faith. And he prunes those who are bearing fruit that you would bear even more. So hear my heart this morning. Please don't get offended. Hear my heart. I'm going to start with a story. In light of the upcoming Christmas holiday... My seven-year-old has announced that he doesn't believe in Santa Claus anymore. Hear me. Not believing in Santa Claus anymore is not an example of deconstruction. Watch. Matthew isn't deconstructing his Western narrative of winter traditions through an empathic lens that exposes the misogyny of toxic teaching coming from his opposite-gendered white oppressors, otherwise known as parents. He has simply grown and matured and no longer views Christmas the same way that he did. Some of you are using the wrong word to describe what otherwise has been known as natural growth and natural maturity for the last 2,000 years. Growing in your relationship with God, of course, means that there are some views that you used to have that you don't have today. 
Your perspective has changed. Your theology has deepened. Your mind has been renewed. Wrestling with faith is a normal and natural part of Christian development. But if you use pagan words to describe Christian maturity, then all you're doing is reinforcing Babylon's desire to define God's church. Now watch. In Mark 9... Jesus is interacting with a man who is just looking for a miracle for his boy who's severely demon-possessed. I want you to know today we're a church that still believes in casting out demons. Now, I don't believe there's a demon under every rock, but I do believe that there's a devil with a lot of his little minions and helpers who loves to wreak havoc and chaos in God's created world. And part of the kingdom coming to earth is God restoring and redeeming and renewing what the enemy has sought to steal, kill, and destroy. So yeah, we're going to cast out demons. Yeah, we'll stand against some of those things. And there's just a man in Mark 9 who needs a miracle. And Jesus has an interaction with him where he asks the man, do you believe that I can free your boy? And I love the honesty of Mark 9 because by the way, God isn't opposed to your honesty. God isn't opposed to your transparency. What he stands against is you building an altar to a process that you were meant to walk through. Now watch, watch, Mark 9. Jesus said to him, if you can believe all things are possible, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Watch, help my unbelief. Maybe the best picture of faith from the synoptic gospels comes from Mark 9. Can I tell you, that is what an honest person of faith is willing to admit. Yeah, sometimes people in our community walk around like they've never had a faithless moment. Well, as soon as God said it, I've just believed it all these years, and I never walked through doubt. Yes, you have. And if you were to be honest, some of you walk through doubt from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. about every day of the week. And I love the honesty of Mark 9. God, I believe. Help my unbelief. I feel like that's where I'm at as a leader and as a pastor. I know God has put a burden on my heart for the region. I see it in my spirit. God is opening up doors in other cities, but I just don't exactly know how it's going to happen. And so often my prayer life doesn't look like long prayers. It looks like short prayers mixed with tears. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Now watch. This is normal Christianity. I want you to know we encourage people to wrestle with their faith. We encourage people to ask tough questions. We encourage people to be honest about their doubts because that is where true transformation happens. Friend, that's not deconstruction. That's healthy Christian living. But if I operate as if God owes me answers... I'm only one tough question away from turning my back. If I operate as if God owes me a bailout, I'm only one difficult circumstance from losing my faith. If I operate as if the church owes me constant attention, entertainment, and perfection, you're only one Sunday at pursuit away from being spiritually homeless. When I attack deconstruction, I am coming after the doctrine of demons that convinces a believer to detach themselves from scripture and church, all the while reconfiguring their entire theological paradigm around unhealed pain, unanswered questions, unsubmitted sexuality, and undealt with trauma. Here's the truth. You can't deconstruct this because you didn't write this. You didn't build this. You didn't inspire this. You didn't breathe life into this. You only have permission to tear down what you've built. So if you want to cancel something, cancel your own sin. Cancel your own depravity. Cancel your own dysfunction. And spare us from the sanctimonious hashtags and empty virtue signaling. You're not the victim of some heteronormative, cisgendered, patriarchal conspiracy to keep you down. Your life is the product of your decision making. And that's why you should choose this day whom you will serve. You can win first place in the victim Olympics or you can be an overcomer, but you can't do both. And why do all the offended people always find each other in church? Because like spirits attract like spirits. And you can't disciple what you ought to cast out. 
You can grow from your pain or you can worship your pain, but you can't do both. You can allow scripture to change you or you can change scripture to appease culture, but you can't do both. Uh, Russell, it sounds like you're being a little sarcastic today and, 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 and a little mocking today. Yes, I am. Because some ideas are so bad, they are worthy of regular derision in the public square. Elijah mocks the prophets of Baal. Isaiah mocks the idol makers of his day. Jesus mocks the Pharisees in their hypocrisy. Paul mocks the sexual sin of the Corinthians. Peter mocks the Gnostic teachers infiltrating the New Testament church. I am officially mocking the witches and warlocks who thought they controlled this region. I am officially mocking the power-hungry politicians who thought they could shut down this church. I am officially mocking the naysayers and doomdayers who thought our best days were behind us. I am officially mocking the progressive leaders who thought that by abandoning scripture, redefining marriage, and embracing wokeness, they could grow churches and expand their influence. Your plans have backfired. The pit you dug, you have fallen into. Jesus is still on the throne, and his church is advancing by fort. If your pastor spent more time appeasing the mob while writing open letters condemning people who didn't agree with their political leanings, then go ahead and stay closed. We'll take it from here. If your spiritual leaders can't even formulate one clear statement on the biblical ethic of life and gender, then go ahead and stay closed. We'll take it from here. If your church spent more time talking about privilege while accusing everyone else of being racist, go ahead and stay closed. We'll take it from here. We don't have time for your foolishness. The days are short. And if standing up for biblical orthodoxy burns a bridge, I have matches. We ride at dawn. We got a whole generation of folks who wake up every morning only ever asking one question, what can I be offended about today? And then they take their marching orders from social media or mainstream news, not me, not here, not now. Choose Christ and have freedom or choose culture and have bondage. Choose church and have community or choose isolation and have oppression. Choose righteousness and have joy or choose sin and have a soul tie. But make no mistake about it, this is a time of choosing. And what I've found is that when the choice is already made, the question is easier to answer. I choose Christ. Hear me, Fred, not all questions are created equal. How many questions did Christ respond to in the New Testament? Dr. Copenhaver of Yale University makes this observation. In the Gospels, Jesus was asked 183 questions. He only directly answered eight. In turn, Jesus himself asked 307 questions to the people around him. The eight that Jesus answered are in this order. Jesus directly answers Peter twice. Jesus directly answers the disciples twice. Jesus directly answers the Pharisees once. Jesus directly answers the rich young ruler once. Jesus directly answers the scribes once. Jesus directly answers the high priest once. Backslidden, backslidden secularists would ask disingenuous questions based on faulty presuppositions, and then complain when Christ won't answer them, kinda like today. I'm not on trial, the world is not my judge, and I don't owe the culture an answer. Why? Because I don't subscribe to your constructs. I don't acknowledge the framing of your inquiries. I cannot in good faith answer a question that was not first asked in good faith to begin with. It's almost as if God doesn't owe us answers, but instead we owe him allegiance in the midst of our questioning. 
In contrast, Jesus himself asked 307 questions of the people around him. Questions like this, who do you say that I am? Why are you so afraid? What are you looking for? Do you want to be made well? Why do you call me good? What do you want me to do for you? Where is your faith? Do you believe I can do this? See, friend, when God asks a question, get ready, because he's about to provide the answer. And I hear God asking me questions about this church and about this region, and I get excited, not because I have the answer, but because Christ is the answer. God doesn't ask you questions because he's looking for your input. He's not looking for your perspective. In fact, God can really do his job even without your advice. When God asks you a question, it's because he's getting you ready for what he's about to do next. Do you want to be made well? Because guess what? It's happening. Why do you call me good? Because I'm about to display my goodness. Who do you say that I am? Because revelation is about to encounter your mind. What do you want me to do for you? Because this is an atmosphere of miracles. Anytime God asks us a question, it's to prepare the interior framework of our heart for what he's about to do. I think sometimes believers feel ill-equipped to engage in the apologetic questioning of the world around us. And oftentimes what you have is young people who was raised in church. Maybe they were never challenged in a spirit-filled environment. They're kind of like mediocre saved through high school, but once they get to college, they almost always abandon the faith. The reason why I bring that up is twofold. Number one, it speaks to the importance of this church and our generation's pastors who are reaching young people. Number two, I think we need to reframe the way that we understand our engagement with the world around us. I am under no burden to ask, answer false questions from a world who isn't interested in the answer, which is Christ. I want to be ready to give a defense. Sure, I want to be ready to engage in the public square. Absolutely, I want to be able to speak intelligently about why I believe what I believe. I want to talk about epistemology and ontology, and I want to talk about Christ being the way and the absolute reality and the ultimate truth, and we can have all of those questions, and we can have all of those debates, and we can have all of those conversations, but until people encounter the living God, no answer is ever enough. And sometimes we get tongue-tied trying to answer a bunch of disingenuous questions. And here's the reality. Even when Christ was calling disciples and Nathaniel showed up and said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And his friend replied, come and see. Not let me explain it. Not let me exegete it. Not let me draw you a graph. Not let me help explain it in a seven-part series. Come and see. When we launch four services, that's what I'm declaring over this region. Come and see. Come be a part of what God is doing in this region. Is it always pretty? No. Are we the best at it? Not really. But I think what God has found is people who are just willing to agree with him. And what this region deserves is an encounter with God. Come and see. Well, what about this? And I can't believe you hold that position and you're just a hater and you're just a fill in the blank. They will call you every name in the book. But when your identity is seated in heaven, you are not moved by either the affirmation or critique of the crowd. I've just got to be liked by everybody. Then go sell ice cream. (laughs) But if you want to follow Christ, pick up your cross. You want to follow Christ, turn your back on the world and follow him. You want to follow Christ, reject every other system in pursuit of who he is. You want to follow Christ, lay down your extreme partisanship. You want to follow Christ, reject every other identity the world tries to confer upon you. You want to follow Christ, get used to them saying all sorts of things without it rattling who you are. Now watch, watch. Let me give you four questions the world asked of God. Let me give you four questions the world asked of God. Number one, we find in Genesis 3 and 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, watch, did God really say? Did God really say? You must not eat from any tree in the garden. Here's my concern. 
Here's my concern. If I could rewrite Genesis 3 for our world today, here's my concern. But the world was more crafty than the church. So the world said to the church, did God really say? It was a question regarding his sovereignty. Does God have the right to make a truth claim about your life that you may not always understand? If you'll notice in the Genesis 3 narrative, God didn't give Adam and Eve an owner's manual describing all of the background for why he said not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He just said, don't do it. And sometimes we operate as if God doesn't provide a sufficient answer to our why, then we're exempt from his sovereignty. Did God really say? Did God really define what it looks like to live a a spirit-filled life? Does Christ really have the ability to command my life, my ethic, my identity, and my sexuality? Did God really say? See, it's a question wrapped in disingenuous framing. It's not meant to reflect on the things that God has actually said. It's meant to get you to undermine the things that God has already clearly said. And it was an attack on God's sovereignty. Watch, friend, when you know what God has said, it gives you foundation. But when you know what God is saying, it gives you future. (laughs) We are both a scriptural church and a prophetic church. Because I know what God has said. But I also lean in because I hear what the Spirit is saying. And sometimes people get too prophetic. They don't have foundation. They think that their words are just as inspired as these words. Not how it works. They think that their revelation is just as profound as this revelation. Not how it works. Some folks are too prophetic for their own good. They don't have foundation. But can I tell you, I think the more common misstep in churches today is that we got all the foundation and the framing, but we got no life in the house. And I think we can be a church that does both well. Not only that, but watch the question in Matthew 4, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, into the wilderness. God is not just in the leading of the moments of your life that feel really good. He's also the sovereign conductor that takes you through seasons you would never walk through yourself because he's developing deeper things than you could ever realize. The spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, it's where the devil took advantage to try to tempt him. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry and the tempter came. Watch, the tempter came and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. It wasn't just the attack on sovereignty in Genesis 3. It was the attack on identity in Matthew 4. A question regarding his identity, if you are the son of God. Let me show you how this manifests today. If you are really a bunch of Christians, you would just participate in the following Christian, in the following activities. Sorry, mainstream media, you don't get to dictate to the church how real Christians should behave. Sorry, political tyrants, you don't get to dictate to the church how real Christians should behave. Sorry, backslidden millennials, you don't get to dictate to the church how real Christians should behave. Sorry, big tech and big pharma, you don't get to dictate to the church how real Christians should behave. If you are the son of God, then you'll do the following things. If you're really a church, you'll participate in the following activities. We, it is high time to stop allowing folks who are not in right relationship with God to dictate the parameters of your right relationship with God. If you were really a bunch of Christians, well, if you're really a bunch, if, if, if you really kind of, you know, understood Christ, if you really, you know, we got folks who aren't in church trying to make rules for how the church should gather. We got folks who aren't in relationship with God trying to frame in how you ought to operate in your relationship with God. Man, that's why you need a pastor and a community and a church. This is why you got to be grounded in orthodoxy, not drifting towards heterodoxy. This is why you got to be attached to the scriptures, the faith of our fathers, attached to something historic. This is why you got to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Because when you get isolated and alone, you become suspect to the influence of people who are not interested in your future. 
They're just interested in you bowing at the altar of their opinion. If you're really the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. It wasn't just an attack on his sovereignty. It was an attack on his identity. Matthew 21, the third attack, Jesus entered the temple courts. And while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. And they said this, by what authority are you doing these things? It wasn't just an attack on his sovereignty. It wasn't just an attack on his identity. But in Matthew 21, it was an attack on his authority. It's not just that Jesus has truth. He has the sovereign prerogative and authority to enforce it. By what authority does the church teach these things? The authority that's been delegated from above. By what authority are you operating under? The authority that's been delegated from above. Can I tell you, friend, as a Christian, you don't operate with individual authority. You operate with delegated authority. Which means this. You don't have the right to redefine scriptures to reinforce your sin. Because we are not islands of authority unto ourselves. It'd be like if I got up here today and said, open your Bibles to the New Testament. Let me, let me prove to you this morning why Jesus isn't really the Son of God. No, I don't have the authority to reinterpret the text because I didn't write it. And I don't operate with my own authority. I operate under sovereign, given authority from God. We are ambassadors of Christ, which means we represent what he is saying. So as it pertains to understanding scriptures, rightfully dividing the word of truth, workmen worthy of their hire, show, sh showing themselves approved by the diligent study of the historic texts. What we are saying is, God, I have given up my right to redefine around the offenses of our world today. It's so interesting. We are in this unique cultural, philosophical, and political moment, and it is all converging in one major intersection. And what we are having today is people reimagining the last 6,000 years of world history through a very new and nuanced moral lens. Things that were okay last week are not okay this week because politicians got together and played intersectional bingo and found a new oppressed class by which they could try to cancel you for a behavior you did last week. Sorry, I don't subscribe to your idiocy. Sorry, I don't subscribe to your insane reasoning. We got folks today with a newly adopted morality adjudicating all of history through their narrow lens. Can I tell you, we have a more historic text. We have a more broad view. We have a more well-rounded hope and reason for why we believe and confess what the apostolic fathers have believed and confessed for the last two millennia. And for us, we're aware of the attack on authority, the attack on identity, the attack on sovereignty. Let me end here. Matthew 22, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It wasn't just an attack on his sovereignty. It wasn't just an attack on his identity. It wasn't just an attack on his authority. It was attack on his morality. Hear me, friend. Our commitment to right acting in the world around us is rooted in the greatest commandment. Love God with everything that you have and then allow that love to define your interactions with the world around you. To just say love wins ignores the reality that we can love the wrong things. No, we love God first. In Matthew 22, and I'll end here in verse 29, responding to a question from the Pharisees trying to trap him, Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know their scriptures nor the power of God. Pursued, if we get this one thing right, it will save us from the deception of the age. We know the scriptures and we know the power of God. That is who we are. No, I'm not going light on the scriptures. No, I'm not. We're not turning this into a TED talk on how you can live a better life because you're the real center of the gospel. This isn't about your comfort and it's not about your self-fulfillment. It is about your self-denial. Follow Jesus with everything that you have. It will require that you give up every other pagan idol, adultery, uh, uh, fornication. It will require that you reject every other identity. Yes, go all in on Jesus. 
So we're going we're go, to we're go teach and trust the scriptures. Watch. But we're never going to compromise on the power of God. Because you can search the scriptures and miss him. Because the Pharisees did it. So we're going to teach the scriptures, but then we're going to have power encounters at the altar because when we marry the spirit to the word, it leads to transformation in the church. This is who we are. Come on, would you stand with me as we close? Let me pray for you. Let me encourage you in the Lord. Listen, today's message is what I would call prophetic teaching. I'm a little more in my notes. I'm a little more line upon line, precept upon precept, but here's what I'm doing. I'm laying framework, not just for who the church is today, but who we're gonna be in 20 years. We are laying the framework. We are setting the trajectory for the orthodoxy of the church. Because if we are not grounded and rooted and anchored in what God is saying, we are lost in a sea of moralistic outrage in the world around us. Now, we're going to be people who know the scriptures, and we're going to be people who experience the power of God. Father, now in the name of Jesus, we thank you that scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And God, we thank you as we have ingested the word this morning, it builds faith in our lives to expect you to perform in accordance with what you have said. And so now we ask spirit of truth, spirit of truth, Holy Spirit, come renew our minds. Come redeem our perspectives. Come restore our worldviews. Come challenge us in the innermost in such a way that we are built up, that we will stand strong, that we will not falter in our hour of trial. May we be light in the world around us, unafraid and unapologetic. Would you make us wise as serpents, but watch and gentle as doves. And may the dove, the spirit of God, rest upon us in a significant way. May we love you with everything that we have and in turn love the world around us in the way that you have loved us. And so God, today we commit to biblical orthodoxy and also an unmitigated pursuit of your presence by which your power fills us and empowers us to live out the mission of God. We say, may these things be true about these people who have gathered and we commit them to your name. In Jesus' name, come on, all God's people said amen. Amen. Friend, if you're here today and you need a miracle in your life, Come on, you need some breakthrough. You need an encounter. Why don't you come to the altar? I'd love to add my faith to yours to see God do something significant in you and through you. If not, God bless. Thanks so much for joining us. Today, immediately following the service, we're doing our VIP experience on my left and your right. If you're new here today and uh, you'd like to meet me and some of our other pastoral staff, I'd love to invite you to our VIP experience. Love to shake your hand and give you a gift if you're new or newer here to our community. God bless. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you next week.